By her own account, Maria Edmonia Lewis was born on or around July 4th of 1844 in Greenbush, now Renesailor, New York. She died in London, England in 1907. This interview is comprised of Edmonia's own words, as well as responses crafted from the words of those who knew her and would humbly seek to speak on her behalf. As we explore the life of this singularly talented artist and cosmopolitan, the unadorned facts that delineate the timeline of her life will be rounded out by Edmonia's art, words, and perspective as we look to create a more coherent portrait of her unique path and experience. Edmonia Lewis' love of art and her desire to pursue sculpture as a person of mixed African-American, Haitian, and Native American descent made her necessarily cosmopolitan in a time when few others chose to embrace a similar philosophy. In order to access the formal art training available in the United States at the time, Edmonia was forced to live across cultural divides without ever fully surrendering the local values that went deeply into the very fabric of her identity. Born to an Ojibwe mother and a father of mixed Haitian and African-American descent, when asked about her parents' unique love, Edmonia answered, My mother was a wild Indian and was born in Albany, of copper color and with straight black hair. There she made and sold moccasins. My father saw her and married her. Ever since I heard how my mother invited a man heading north, a man who was free but a dangerous color, into her bark house, I have understood that hiding and courage are part of love. After her mother died, while Edmonia was still very young, her maternal aunt adopted Edmonia and her brother. Far from being a small and sheltered Ojibwe community, Edmonia lived on the edge of a society that did not truly accept her, but that required her to meet and converse with the white tourists passing through to purchase moccasins and other Ojibwe crafts from her aunt and neighbors. At 16 years old, Edmonia left New York for Oberlin College, the first school of its kind to accept men and women, rich and poor, white and colored. While Edmonia represented a bright and promising student, her time at Oberlin was heavy with misfortune bred of prejudice. In this idealistic setting, the cosmopolitan philosopher Kwame Apaya might note that the conversation did not run deep enough and the mixed society still struggled with the process of getting used to each other. In her own words, Edmonia described the forest surrounding Oberlin as her only refuge from the school famous for accepting all, boys and girls, white and colored, the good and the better be grateful, even though the lines between us were firm as fences. Despite Edmonia's own ability to befriend and bridge, in the winter of 1862, when her white roommates fell ill from what was suspected to be poison, racial tensions flared, and Edmonia faced accusations laden with bias but void of any truth. Just days later, while walking home at night, she was savagely attacked. That February, still healing from her assault, Edmonia faced a judicial hearing and was acquitted of the charges for lack of evidence. In 1863, Edmonia was again accused, this time of stealing art supplies from the college. While the charges were quickly dismissed, Oberlin College denied Edmonia admission for her final term. Edmonia returned briefly to New York. When asked if she would stay, Edmonia replied, there is nothing so beautiful as the free forest. To catch a fish when you are hungry, cut the boughs of a tree, make a fire to roast it, and eat it in the open air is the greatest of all luxuries. I would not stay a week pent up in cities if it were not for my passion of art. And so she left once again, this time headed for Boston and carrying letters of introduction to the famed abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. In Boston, Edmonia continued her training as a sculptor and established herself as a portraitist. As she honed her skills, she sought advice, critique, encouragement, support, and the favor of publicity from people of note within her community. In August of 1865, with an invitation to sculpt the bust of Abraham Lincoln, Edmonia sailed for Europe. When prompted to describe her general feelings upon entering Italy, Edmonia admonished, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had not room for a colored sculptor. She also admitted, I thought I knew everything when I came to Rome, but I soon found that I had everything to learn. She took up company with a community of artists and actors who introduced her to Rome's artisan scene. While Italy appeared in many ways foreign, Edmonia was often surprised by the similarities she felt welling up inside of her. Once, she remembered from a conversation with the famous sculptor Harriet Hosmer, I was speaking with Harriet about the courtyard where she regularly worked. She noted that the courtyard suited her for a variety of reasons suiting her artistic sensibility, but importantly, it was also convenient for the tourists to stop in and watch her work. 
My mind unwittingly drifted back to my aunt's weaving sweet grass while strangers stared. In Italy, the demand for Edmonia's work grew and she was able to increasingly gain the commission for works born out of her own artistic vision. This vision wove together her classical training with the threads of her past. It was in Italy that she sculpted Freed Woman and Her Child, the first ever emancipation statue by an African American. She then created Old Arrow Maker and His Daughter, The Wooing of Hiawatha, based on Henry Longfellow's epic poem Hiawatha, inspired by his time among the Ojibwe and Iroquois people. Edmonia would also sculpt the bust of Minnehaha, the female protagonist of the epic in future years. Among her most famous works, The Death of Cleopatra is notable. We might ask what specifically inspired you, Edmonia, to sculpt Cleopatra. I have a strong sympathy for all women who have struggled and suffered. When I remember back to the time waiting for the verdict to fall in Oberlin, I remember asking myself, Edmonia, if the worst happens, you won't be like Cleopatra, will you? You mean choosing poison over prison, I asked myself, and I concluded that she did the noble thing. During return visits home, Edmonia was often asked why she would return to Italy. In her most poignant response, Edmonia replied, I'm going back to Italy to do something for the race, something that will excite the admiration of the other races of the earth. Thusly, Edmonia chiseled the faces and stories of African American and Native American men and women into marble, rightfully placed alongside Greek heroes and modern muses, sculpted into one of the art's highest, or at the very least costliest, mediums, to be admired for generations following. Edmonia's cultural background and multicultural education mutually enriched her artwork over the course of her lifetime. She studied sculpture among the modern and mainstream artists of Boston and Italy, but her work often reflected the imagery and folklore of her early Ojibwe upbringing. Edmonia's life was a series of exposures to people outside of her home culture that she, through Opaya's broad notion of conversation, allowed to shape and influence her work. In one of Opaya's most persuasive passages, he urges, we should learn about people in other places, take an interest in their civilizations, their arguments, their errors, and their achievements, not because this will bring us to agreement, but because it will help us get used to one another. Edmonia's response to this challenge is exemplary as she pursued her art with passionate vigor, informed by both what she knew and what she learned from other peoples, as she waited for the world to catch up to her cosmopolitan outlook and come to the realization that they had just as much to learn from her as she had learned from others. Sometimes the times were dark and the outlook was lonesome, but where there is a will, there is a way. I pitched in and dug at my work until now I am where I am. It was hard work, though, both with color and sex against me. I have achieved success. That is what I tell my people whenever I meet them, and that they must not be discouraged, but work ahead until the world is bound to respect them for what they have accomplished. <laughs>